Welcome to Somebody You Love or The Sale of Two Titties. I'm Jenna Love. And I'm Holly Hart. And we're experts in disappointing our parents, breaching community guidelines and banging the people who vote against our rights. Today, we'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're recording today. I'm on the land of the Ngunnawal people. And I'm on the land of the Darug and Gundungurra peoples. We'd like to pay our respects to any elders and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. We want to make a point to say that the sex working community is incredibly diverse, which is one of the coolest things about it. Uh, and there's a huge amount of intersectionality within it. Um, so we can only speak from our own experience, of course. We can't speak uh, on behalf of sex workers. But we are in the process now of chatting to some potential guests and once we've got things up and sorted, we will be bringing uh, some other perspectives onto the show, which we are really excited about. As you may have worked out, there will be some adult themes that we discuss. So if you're not an adult, this might not be the podcast for you. Today, we have a bit of a holly sode. Uh, we are going to talk about stripping, or I believe the preferred term is exotic dancing. So it's a stripper sode, a holly sode stripper sode. And the reason it's a holly sode is because I know literally nothing, absolutely nothing about stripping. So I'm going to hand it over to Holly. Thank you. The pressure is on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, Okay, so I guess, uh, you know, I've got a few specific topics I'd like to talk about today or that I think you guys might all find interesting. Um, I also wanted to preface it by saying I these are only my experiences. Um, there are so many clubs, you know, worldwide and so many different sorts of clubs in Australia and people, different people that dance at them who all have different experiences and this is only my small, narrow experience. Um, you know, it, I think it's been... Oh, about eight years, seven or eight years since I danced. So things might have changed a lot since then as well. Um, you know, I did do strip club management and things like that as well, but it's been a while since I've been in the club. So this is all just my little experience and I don't speak for strippers in general. Just reiterating that. Of course. Uh, because I don't want people who are listening who have been strippers or who are strippers going, what? That's not true. So how did you get into stripping? That is a very good question. Um it's a hard one to answer because it was a long journey. Uh, so basically I'd always been interested in the sex industry, as I've discussed before. I had done a little bit of brothel work. Um, at the time I actually was working in a brothel and a new strip club opened in Canberra and my friend started dancing there. A few people I knew in Canberra started dancing there and they had this really active social media, like a really active Facebook where they'd post all these girls, glamorous women partying, looking really sexy, this mysterious, you know, nighttime world that just sort of intrigued me massively. So I was really fascinated by that. I was already a topless waitress or, you know, in you know that sort of realm yeah like the promotional sort of stuff exactly well I'd done promo yeah. stuff I had you know it's this sort of path that I did which was you know I became a promo model and did you know Bundy Rum and, and all those sorts of brands you know giving out you know stubby holders and things like that in regional New South Wales so I used to travel and do that and then someone uh, mentioned, you know, bikini or, you know, uh, lingerie waitressing, which I then moved into that, uh, which was like, oh, what was that, like a, you know, $100 an hour or something, which was a lot of money. Um, well, wow, actually, yeah. I think it was $60 an hour for bikini and 100 for topless. So, yeah, I remember my first shift doing that was terrifying. So I did a range of those sorts of topless waitressing jobs and lingerie waitressing, and it was really, really nerve-wracking. Like I remember my first topless waitressing gig was at the Tully Park Tavern in Goulburn, and I remember walking into the bathroom and putting on this little outfit and going in and, you know, taking my bra off, and I stood in front of the mirror and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Like how are you about <laughs> to walk out into this pub full of men and a lot from the police academy because it's in Goulburn. And I was like, like, what are you? And I just pushed myself, opened the door and walked out. And everyone in the pub turns around and looks at you with your titties out. And I was like, well, I'm doing this. And <laughs> it was so much fun. They were so nice. And, you know, there's a big culture of tipping in that. So, you know, you make quite good money. And I was just chuffed, you know. Um, I had such a fun time. Wow, so I was good on you. That does require huge bravery, I think. It, it was massive, yeah. And yeah. I did various other jobs. Um 
you know, one of them uh, I did on a train. So we actually uh, drove out to, well, I drove out to Goulburn um, and there was about five or six of us waitresses and it was an old train company and they took us, God, I don't know, somewhere out into New South Wales. I don't even know now to this beautiful restaurant and it was just this really fun gig. But I was sitting at the table with a whole lot of these girls who I felt like they were maybe dancers and I was quite like, I don't want to say sweet and innocent, but once again, I have that sort of naive sort of wide eyed girl. And I thought these girls were all so like edgy and bad and hot. And like, you know, I was really intimidated by them, especially this girl with this beautiful, like she had this bright red hair, like dyed, you know, bright red hair. And she just had the longest legs you've ever seen. And we were sitting at the table and I said, oh, they all mentioned they were strippers. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, that's really awesome. And, um, Turned out they had met my partner at the time who was cheating on me hanging around the strip club, but that's uh, may or may not be a relevant story. And uh, (laughs) um, I drove back to Canberra that night and it was just on my mind. I just was in love with that strip club. So a combination of having met these girls at a topless waitressing job and having seen the social media, it just was brewing in my mind. So I went for lunch with one of my friends who was dancing at the club and she sort of told me all about it. She was like, just do it. So I did. Yeah, that's sort of the story. So I contacted the owner and asked to start and she basically put me on. And and, uh, that was the beginning of what was one of the most fun experiences of my life. Like I absolutely loved being a stripper. It was a really cool time. Um, The only reason I stopped is because I met a man who didn't want me to do it anymore. And so I stopped dancing and um, yeah, that relationship That relationship didn't work out anyway, and I was really disappointed um, that I had given that up. But I, uh, I moved on to other things by then. So yeah, I should probably explain that that sound was <laughs> my uterus imploding on itself at disgust. <laughs> he was a security guard, and he didn't like see. It made him angry to see me dance. So, uh, which is funny because he, you know, really fell in love with me dancing, which is a whole thing. Yeah, of course he did. I hate him. <laughs> So, yeah, just, uh, you know, what about uh, – what's your understanding of strip clubs, Jenna? What have you seen? Have you been to one? What's your vibe? All right. My <laughs> – as I said, I have no experience and I'm so going to get cancelled for this, but they just sound <laughs> so awful to me. Like I can't imagine many environments that would be less pleasant for me. Uh, so, no, I haven't ever been to a strip club. Literally, my experience with stripping is – I watched uh, an amateur community production of The Full Monty. That was awful. Um, And when I was 16 or 17, a stripper came into my work and did a show in the back room, and that is a whole other bizarre story. Oh, wow. Yeah, very strange. Yeah. So, yeah, very little experience. I think the thing is for me, like, uh, and look, I'm, I'm really keen to be educated on this episode um, and it's entirely possible that I'm completely wrong about all of this, but my perception of a strip club is that it would be uh, loud, that there would be loud music and that's something I'm not very comfortable with. I imagine that there's usually alcohol being served. Basically all of the things that I couldn't handle about going to a nightclub. It sounds like it, like the part with people taking their clothes off is fine. It's all the rest of it. The fact that it's at nighttime, which is when I sleep, um, the fact that it would be probably dark and loud and that there, you know, I have some issues with alcohol, which I've, I've touched on, but haven't gone into any details, but being around people who are drunk and, or who are kind of visibly under the influence is quite difficult for me. So it just, the whole environment just sounds so awful. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can understand from the performer's perspective, having been a performer and a dancer myself and also a sex worker, I totally, I think I could quite enjoy the, the performance, but um, I don't understand why anyone would want to be in the audience, but obviously (laughs) a lot of people do. Um, it's just not for me. I think maybe I could be wrong. Maybe I'll go and love it. Yeah. Maybe one day I'll take you on an adventure. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to happen. I don't know why I said that. I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> not at night time. If you can take me like in oh, the day. daytime strip club. Ooh, when okay. they turn the music off. It's doesn't happen. It doesn't happen much in Canberra, I'm afraid. See? Okay. <laughs> so strip clubs, look, this is just the basics on how they work. So this, you know, if you've been a stripper, you know this, you know this and, but there's a lot of people who might not know. So basically um, to work in a strip club, you have to pay to work each night. So you actually don't get paid by the house. You have to pay in Canberra, usually 
in my time, it was about $100 a night um, that you would pay to work. There were also fines that were applicable. So basically, if you, you know, I don't know, wanted to leave the shift early or if you turned up late or if you uh, were too intoxicated or I don't know, a range of things, you could be fined by the house. They, yeah, so usually that didn't happen often though. You know, usually in my experience, um, it was all about the house fees, which is what you know the fees you pay to work basically in where I was working all the tips that you earn on stage were yours so you can keep whatever they throw up there on that stage you keep it and it differs with some strip clubs but generally if you take them out the back for a lap dance the house takes a percentage of that so basically you know for someone who's never been, the way a strip club works is you, you walk in and there's a stage and there's usually, you know, two dancers on the stage and you can put your tips up there. So they're up there for 15 minute cycles and you tip them and they can come over and shake their boobs in your face. And that's sort of, you know, a very light tease of what a lap dance is. If you, you know, then wish to take them for a lap dance, you sort of approach them when they're not on stage and they'll take you into like a back room where you they will get fully nude and do like a, a little show for you for about three songs. So that's, you know, about 12 ish minutes. Um, and that can range from, you know, 70 to a hundred dollars. In my time, we got to keep all of that money. That was, we would keep every lap dance fee. But since then, I believe the culture in Canberra has changed. And I, I believe that the house takes a percentage of that. Um, some places do it by selling tipping dollars or selling lap dance dollars. So then they can like cash it out at the end of the night and take their cut from that. But sometimes they just, um, yeah, they have someone at the door that takes the cash and, and times the dances and all that sort of stuff. So um, mm-hmm. that's sort of how it works. So look, there's a lot of potential to make a lot of money, but there were definitely a lot of nights where I made no money. Uh, I'm not a natural hustler. I'm or even someone... lost money potentially. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. There were oh, nights where I made yeah. no money and uh, and I went to the owner and said, you know, it's a, it's a quiet night. Can I have my house fee back? And they said like, how dare you ask basically. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I was bold, oh. um, but it was not. Yeah, you just that's the risk you take. So, yeah, there's a lot of pressure, I think, when you're a dancer um, in that regard. And also, obviously, you're on ridiculous heels for, you know, can be 12 hour nights. Um, plus, you're dancing every two hours or three hours or less than you're up doing 15 minute sets of quite f- heavy physical exertion on a pole. So it's quite intense work. I think people sometimes, you know, say, oh, I'll quit school and become a stripper. Ugh. I mean, it's it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, gosh. Yeah. Okay, so I have some thoughts. Yeah. One is uh, from the outside perspective, like thinking about labor rights, it just seems mm, like kind of not okay. But mm. I uh, like I fully acknowledge that I have no experience in that, and yeah. um, I d- I don't know what it, you know I, I don't have the experience, but on the outside, that just sounds really not like great labor practices in my opinion, yeah. but you know, it is what it is. Look in, um, I know something that a lot of strippers talk about often is, is workers comp because it's actually quite dangerous work. And a lot of yeah. workers will get in, uh, sorry, dancers will get injured. I, um, I still have a shoulder injury from pole dancing. I don't know if that will ever go away. Um, I have, you know, friends who fell from a height who hit the floor quite painfully. Oh, and, and there's, you know, it, you can look up incidents in the U S where, where people have been really injured as well. Um, and have been pushing for it to be covered under workers comp, um, because technically, Do you fall under an employee status? Look, there's been a lot of pushes by different groups to try and get them, you know, strippers recognised as employees so that they can be covered by these things because it can be very dangerous. Is it unethical? I think, I mean, yes, but also it's an industry which a lot of people enjoy and a lot of people love. And these are facilities that provide that opportunity to work. Like in my instance, I really wanted to do it without the strip club. I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, so I took that on for people who, who take on those risks, who don't have a choice that is more exploitative, but there are people who take on those choices knowing that that's the risks that they, you know, endure. So it's, it's, you yeah, know. absolutely. And that's why I say that, you know, my lack of experience is really relevant with that view, because yeah. if, if that, yeah. if that is the way that you can do that job and that's what you want to do, then go nuts yeah. and do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's a thing that, you know, we discuss often, you know, under capitalism, you know, there is just exploitation of people and that's just the way it is. You yes. know, you, people have to Absolutely. make a living, they have to get a job and people, you know, who who employ, you know, have that opportunity to, to exploit and they may, don't see it as exploitation. You know, they think that they're, you know, they're making a business, they're running a business. So, yeah, it is a, a complicated thing. Hmm, it is interesting. Yeah, definitely. So my other thought is... So you're on so you're on stage for 15 minutes you're doing your set. Yeah. Um and then you may be wandering around and then somebody asks you for a lap dance which presum- which presumably is a lot more intimate. Yeah. Don't you smell? Oh my god, probably. I as you know don't <laughs> don't have a sense of smell, so I don't know. Oh yeah, don't, you wouldn't know. Don't know, don't care. Uh, no. I uh, I just would have thought like after performing yeah. that you'd be really sweaty and smelly. You, I would be sometimes like I often have like a like bangs, like a fringe, and my yeah. f- f- hair would be slicked down to my face with sweat. Like I would be drenched with sweat. So after the mm-hmm. after my stage set and most workers, we would pop out the back and you quickly freshen up like for a few seconds, but usually there'll be a couple of, like if it's a busy night, There'll be a couple of guys who have already made eye contact with you while you're on stage who are like giving you the finger, like point, point, like, let's go, let's go. So, you know, there's cash out there and you want to get as many lap dances in that time before you have to get back on stage because you tend to make more out of that than you do on your stage sets. It, you know, obviously depends for different people. So you want to get that cash. So yeah, I'd run out the back and I'd have like a, a really quick ritual, like a really specific ritual I'd do where I'd like get a wet wipe wipe my face down, um, you know, put some fresh deodorant on, get a blow dryer and fluff out my fringe and yeah. um, and then run back but out. But the Vagisil wipes, like I would – it would all be about Vagisil wipes for me. Mm. Like yeah. my pussy would stink. Okay. And then if I'm about to shove that in a guy's face, I guess terrifying. It, like that sounds really bad. It just never occurred to me. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, wow. <laughs> see, that, see, as a, as a full-service sex worker – you know, immediately before oh, yes. a booking, I do I'm like, does my pussy stink? Yes, like yes, that's yes. the, f- you know, uh, which is, do you know what? Like pussies do smell. Yeah. Every, we all smell and it's there's nothing wrong thing. with that. Yeah. But I would, yeah, but I always check that it's not smelling, um, you know, as a result of not having been cleaned for yeah. a while or excess sweating or something yeah. like that. Yeah, obviously when you do full service, you could have showers before, but when you're in a strip club, there are showers and, you know, obviously a lot of strippers shower you know, before they start work. I mean, they, t- they all do, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, if you do like a particularly, like some people would do feature shows. So at like midnight, there would be like a special performer who would do like magic tricks or fire shows or, you know, with oh, jelly cool. and yeah, it's a whole, it's a beaut, it's an art, like amazing women. Um, yeah. And- so that's sort of moving more into the world of burlesque even, isn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah. That seems like a bit of crossover there. Definitely. Um, so they would, you know, have to go and have a shower after that cause they'd be covered in all sorts of things. But yeah, but no, after, after doing a stage, set no sometimes i'd grab a wet wipe and give myself a quick you know freshen up down there but um Mm. you know i just um no (laughs) well i hope our listeners are fascinated because i am fascinated (laughs) um so you had done full service work before stripping and how was that received you know was there an issue with that What, what, what what's the deal yeah look something that people might not realize that in the stripping community full service work is is not well received. So I told my friend, you know, who introduced me to the club that I was a full service worker at the time. And she said, do not tell anyone, do not tell anyone in the club that because that will Mm. not work in your favor. And I was sort of like, what, what do you mean? It's like almost the same thing, isn't it? You know, it's sex work. (laughs) She was just like, don't. Uh, I'm glad she told me because then I went into the club and it's a constant thing. Like, you know, oh, at least we're not fucking them. And, you know, that sort of thing is is very regular. At least we're not hookers and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And there's a lot of whorephobia. Ho- That's really upsetting to hear, it, actually. It is disappointing. Um, especially because I think that we all work so hard to support each other under the umbrella. And, yeah. and I feel like I, you know, I go to a lot of lengths to advocate for dancers and, and it's upsetting to hear that that may not be reflected back, yeah. uh, but it is what it is. And that's also possible that maybe in the last decade that's changed somewhat. That's what I think. I which do, would be nice. I am hopeful that, yeah. it, that in the past couple of years it, it's changed a lot as it has with general society but yeah definitely in my day it was it was very poorly looked upon and um it was really sad well i'm gonna use that to leap into i think the big question that a lot of us outsiders have which is does full service occur at strip clubs or not even necessarily full service but blow jobs hand jobs are there extras available in my experience um almost never 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 oh okay yeah so 
I believe, look, I've heard that in some cities that sort of thing occurs and that, you know, or that they have like a linked brothel that they sort of funnel mm-hmm. people into and things. I've heard stories. Um, so I'm not saying it never happens. But in Canberra, it was not the culture at all. No, you absolutely could not do that sort of thing. It was, yeah, very poorly received. There were rules. There were strict contracts that you'd sign that you would not solicit. Right that you would not and you would be fired if you were caught doing that sort of thing. And in general, you know, I think a lot of the workers or the dancers, sorry, thought they were sort of above that sort of thing anyway. And they were making – Interesting. I guess, I mean, it would be against the the business's licensing ability. So it would put the business at risk and and I can see that they would be, you know, really concerned about that. It's very hard in the ACT to to get a liquor licence to open a strip club. So, yeah, they don't want to put that at risk. And the police are looking, you know, liquor licensing are looking for an opportunity to to slam them. so, yeah. yeah. And we know the police love sex workers. Exactly. So. I mean, they were in there yeah. every night. Yeah. Of course they were. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to let you in on a few secrets of the strip club industry. Uh, they may or may not be secrets, but this is some things that I thought were sort of interesting. Juicy. Juicy. So the change room environment is like a different world. The camaraderie in there is magical. I think a lot of people talk about brothels, girls' rooms, having camaraderie. It's nothing on a strip club. The partnership and the support that the work, the strippers all show each other is massive. Uh, people, you know, there's always going to be people who don't get along and little dramas and stuff. But for the most part, it was such a sisterhood. Everyone became really close friends. Um, there were bedrooms down the back. So at the strip club, one of the strip clubs that I worked at, they had bedrooms for the interstate strippers to sleep in or dancers to sleep in overnight. And... Um, one night I wasn't feeling very well and went and laid down on one of those beds and I looked up at the slats above me and months of dancers that had come to dance there had carved in affirmations and kind words and things to make you feel good while you're reading them and beautiful supportive oh, words. Oh, that's so sweet. And that was just the culture. Like a lot of strippers tend to be really hippies, like more than, you know, what you sort of think of as sex workers, but really – free spirits and really cool people. So there was a massive amount of support. They'd spend a lot of time together outside of dancing and, um, you know, there would be nights where we wouldn't even go out into the club because we'd all be sitting out the back watching TV and laughing and people would be like, there's guys in the club and we'd be like, no, we're enjoying this. Photos of us all cuddled up together watching TV instead of going to earn a living. So it's that's something I think people think that strip clubs might be really bitchy, but in my experience they're super supportive and, you know, I think people think that as well of full service is that it would be quite bitchy, yeah. but generally there's so much support. Um, yeah, look, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest because, yeah. uh, you know, I imagine that strippers face – uh, different but similar levels of stigma and discrimination that we face. Mm. Um, and, you know, throughout history, marginalised communities have always come together to support one another and to, to build each other up. So, I mean, that, that doesn't surprise me and it's really lovely to hear. I was a face-out stripper, so I, I had my face in a lot of their advertising and stuff, and I would say that the hate that I faced as a stripper was was probably more than I face now as a full-service worker. Wow. Which is, I, a very strange thing. I, I don't know. Wow, why. that's fascinating. Yeah. Is it? Do you think that it's be, partly because strippers are more seen by the general public? Like, I, a lot of people just don't know that full service sex work exists. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people in Australia, for instance, don't even know it's legal. They don't, you know, mm. as we talked about last week, saying that it's legal isn't entirely accurate. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, we're, but 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 stripping is is a lot more accessible yes. for a lot of civilians. Yes. I think. I think people don't know when their husbands have gone to see a sex worker, but they hear when their husbands mm. have been with the boys to the strip club, and that's a lot more threatening. Yes. So I think yeah, that that can, can incite a lot more yeah. anger. You're sort um, of the front line. Yeah. Of, yeah, a little bit of yeah. the whores. Yeah. Um, wow. So obviously, you know, there's this whole thing within the strip club culture of the fake tan. You can't not have a fake tan. Everyone's out there fake tanning each other's backs. That airbrush legs, I don't know if you ever used it in your days in like high school. but the it's Sally like, Hansen? Sally Hansen. It's, yeah, like a. Yes, I it, used it in high school. You've got like <laughs> dozens of cans in your locker of yeah. these airbrush legs every night and you're spraying it on you as well as the fake tan. Um, it's, wow. you know, wet wipes are another commodity where everyone is like, have you got a wet wipe? You know, like as a redhead, I yeah. feel offended, but. Oh, no. Anyway. Well, I'm very, very, <laughs> you know, very fair. And you're paler I, than I am. The, yeah. yeah, the first few weeks that I danced I danced without a spray tan and people just sort of 
mocked me for it, like playfully, but they were, they were like, well, what are you doing? Like, and I was like, this is my body and my skin and I love it. And they were like, no, babe, no. <laughs> um, and so wow. I got That is so in. interesting yeah. given you said so many of them are really hippie and really like do yeah. your own thing. Yeah. Um, but then that's just what – but, again, that's something that may have changed recently. Yeah, m- maybe, yeah. kind of nice to an extent, but yeah. if not, whatever. Look, once I started getting the spray tan, it looked it did look good under the lights. That was the big thing is that because you're in <laughs> yes. darkness and there's show lights and, you know, it's – yeah. So, yeah, wet wipes are a massive thing. Everyone's – it's, you know, just as much as, as full service workers. They are everywhere because everyone is, you know, giving themselves a wipe because you can have your genitals up close in someone's face. Um, but I don't know whether they do it after every stage set as discussed. Uh, I certainly didn't. Um, but definitely, you know, yeah, there's 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 wet wipes flying around everywhere. So pretty chaotic, uh, but yeah, good times uh, in the change room environment. The other thing which is really valuable in the strip club community, which I often had or I struggled to get, or it was like I was like, you know, always obsessed with this stuff is dry hands. So that is liquid chalk, essentially. So it was $20 a bottle, little tiny bottle, and I'd drive out to the local pole studio to buy some all the time. I don't know. I didn't. I was so broke at the time. I didn't have any money in my bank account to buy it online. So I was always running out to another suburb to go and buy this dry hand stuff. And that's how you do these beautiful pole tricks. It gives you so much grip on the pole like a gymnast, and it was beautiful. But everyone would steal each other's dry hands. You'd leave it up. You'd be, you know, <laughs> distracted. You'd leave it on, and someone else would take it. And so you'd write your name or you'd put something on it, and it was just – it would always, yeah, go missing or walking off. But super valuable. So if you're ever in a strip club and you see people, like, spraying some stuff on their hands and clapping their hands together before they get on stage, it's essentially liquid chalk, which was – a big deal. Yeah. Well, that uh, that reminds me of uh, tap dancing. I uh, used to be a, a dancer that didn't take my clothes off, oh, although yeah. I probably happily would have. Yes. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Uh, but but with with tap dancing in particular, um, you know you have metal on your feet, so you don't want to slip over. So you have to apply resin to the bottom of your shoes yeah. as well as to the stage, or you have to come up with. There's, I mean, there's lots of little at home hacks people have, um, and as you said, same with gymnasts and, and all of that. Yeah. yeah, friction is important. I would not have just not that. when you're fucking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just the opposite. Yeah, yeah, the opposite of lube exactly. So you asked about whether uh, people, you know, are doing sex work or you know full service yes. work or you full, know yeah. sexual favors and stuff uh in the strip club which generally they're not but also as i said written into the contracts is often you know that you can't sleep with the patrons and not to do that as in outside of well, as a, as a non transactional thing yeah yeah in the blurry it's line strongly discouraged because i guess it just looks you know, it just looks crappy mm. if the girls are strolling out on the arms of, you know, um, patrons. And I guess they just don't think that looks very good. But it happens a lot. A lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I definitely slept with a few patrons. Um, not in the club, but, you know, outside of it and took took numbers where I shouldn't. We were, you know, not allowed to take numbers. So you'd have to do it really discreetly yeah. and dodgily. And, uh, uh, and lots of, you know, strippers that I knew were dating guys that they'd met in the club and the guys would come back in and yeah there was a lot of that going on and it was really fun and naughty and exciting so yeah that happens a lot so I know that's that's probably gonna like piss a lot of people off because you know there's this whole thing of you know strippers don't want to steal your man they're just there to make their money which they are absolutely they're there to work but it's like any job you still do sometimes meet people that take your eye and of course and if they're single yeah, Who gives absolutely. A shit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We all come across people in our work and you might exactly. find yourself attracted to them and you the two of you might be the great romance of our time. Yeah, I actually dated a guy while I was stripping who was just lovely and he, you know, you know, he wasn't the one, but we had a lovely time and it was, you know, a great experience. So, and then I just, you know, banged some guys because they were bangable and that was fun as well. Cuz you wanted to bang them because I was you. horny. Uh which cool. leads into my next question. Um when you're doing a lot of lap dances, a lot of the guys who you're lap dancing on top of sort of go, is this just like like a series of moves or are you actually horny? Like does this actually make you aroused yeah. as well? And I think, you know, like any job, you can go through the motions, but also I think it was really, it is really erotic. It is really sexual and sensual to be naked in front of somebody and to have them admire you. Like it just feels really, yeah. you know, we hate that word, but empowering. It feels really invigorating <laughs> for somebody to just 
eat you with their eyes and not be allowed to touch you. There's no way that you can do that all the time and not find, you know, that exciting on occasion. It definitely, I found it really erotic and a lot of fun. So Yeah, absolutely. look, that reminds me of doing, uh, creating content. Um, you know, I film myself uh, touching myself and, and dancing a bit on camera. It's really not my strength. <laughs> but, and and on the one hand, and depending on the day, on the one hand, sometimes it is just work and I'm just ticking the boxes and, and going, I'm going to do this, 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 because that will make the viewer feel aroused. Um, but at the same time, I do find it quite stimulating. I guess I'm a little bit of an exhibitionist. The thought that somebody yes. is at home jerking off to it really turns me on. I'm like, yes, I'm so hot, <laughs> even though I don't normally think that about myself. But when I'm doing that, I'm just like, mm, yeah, oh, check me out. Damn. And I start feeling really like good about myself. And so um, it's not unusual, actually, for me to film a video and then jerk off afterwards because yeah. I am, yeah, I'm really heightened and, and I am aroused. So I totally get that. I can imagine myself Definitely. getting off on uh, giving a lap dance for sure. Yes. it's Yeah, I would get quite horny. I feel like a really common um, thing that I see civilians talk about, and they apply this to full service workers and, and pretty much everyone in the sex industry really, is um, is the concept of of drinking or, and more so drug use. Is mm. that something that you have thoughts on? Yeah, look, in strip clubs, um, in the ACT in my day, uh, drug <laughs> use was just not a thing that happened. Obviously people, you know, maybe privately were, were doing what they were doing, um, but it just wasn't really a big thing. Um, I know that... I feel like it's got to be hard to be upside down on a pole <laughs> if you're off your face. I don't know. No? Okay. No, I've... <laughs> I don't know. I think I've it looks done, difficult to me. I've done some things in my time that I think uh, I could have done better if I was on various drugs. But uh, <laughs> I think, <laughs> okay. look, uh, I think since I moved, you know, further out of the industry, the strip club scene that is, uh, that there, I've heard stories of there being increased um, drug usage. Yeah, but definitely drinking was a massive thing. Uh, like I was drunk a lot of the time, which I don't think. I see as a damaging thing. I don't think it was a negative. I was sort of in a party lifestyle and I, I was having a fun time. Um, I definitely, you know. That's exactly what I was going to say. I feel like if you weren't at work, you would have been out drinking yeah. and doing it anyway. Like yes. it, it's not, yeah. So that's what it felt like to me. It felt like, you know, a few t- few days a week I was out with the girls partying and getting paid for it. So that was really cool. Um, and um, But then there were definitely strippers who didn't drink and, you know, strippers who, you know, I guess everyone has their different things. But drinking definitely is a big part of being a stripper, I think. I, I think people make a lot of judgments. Absolutely they do. And I think the issue comes when there's the connection to the work and the substance use. Like in, in my experience, um, there are people in brothels who will be under the influence of drugs and or alcohol because that's something about them personally, that they are somebody who does drink or does yeah. does use drugs. I've never had a drop of alcohol or any uh, prohibitive drugs in my life, so I don't do that at work either. And that's exactly the same as a lawyer. A lawyer who does drugs is a lawyer who does drugs and a lawyer who doesn't do drugs is a lawyer who doesn't do drugs and that has nothing to do with their job. Absolutely. It's just whether that person does that or not. So this kind of, ooh, like it sort of instantly connecting the job with the uh, with the substance really sort of makes these connections and, and suggests that the job is somehow responsible for the substance, which it isn't. It's the individual. I think you've summed that up really, really well. That's um, pretty much exactly the point I was stumbling trying to make is that, <laughs> yeah, it, it, people, some people will do th- some things um, at work and some people won't and it, it's really irrelevant um, to the job. Um, you know, like I said, being in a strip club and having alcohol available means that people will do it um, but plenty of people don't and it, I don't think it's because of the job um, that anyone, you know, makes those decisions. No. Actually, something that uh, I think Lana Jade said in Are You Available, her podcast, um, just the other day, she said, you know, there's people say, oh, am I just funding your drug habit? Are you just going to spend the money from stripping or from sex work on drugs? And she was like, well, yes, <laughs> that's why people work to spend their money on the things they want to spend it on. What do yeah. you mean? You're funding anyone's drug habit by giving them like what absolutely what do you mean i mean i spend most of my sex work money on fucking coke no sugar yeah. and i don't see anyone you know yeah. that's a problem but uh, yeah. that's my choice yes yeah 
So I know you obviously, for obvious reasons, don't have the experience personally, but what has been, what, what are your thoughts on male strippers? Are they perceived differently? Um, yeah, what's the deal? Yeah, that's an interesting topic. Um, look, male strippers obviously for a long time have been really trendy. It's been cool since, you know, like Jamie Dury and, you know, the Chippendales and Manpower and things like that have been, I think since the 80s, it's, you know, very cool to go and see a, a male strip show, whereas female strippers are, you know, stigmatised and dirty mm. and, you know, it's – um that's, Yeah, and I hit mean, in the dark a bit more. Yeah. Less which, mainstream, isn't it? Absolutely, which is, is really, you know, not cool. But something that I have heard and discussed with male strippers myself, when I would go and do like a show, you know, a Bucks party or something like that, um, even when I wasn't surrounded by security, so I used to not take security to these shows because I was naive, the men would be quite respectful of my boundaries 99% of the time. If I said don't touch me or don't do that, they wouldn't do it and they were, you know, they would listen and respect that. In the strip club, obviously security is quite overbearing, but still generally people were just respectful um, of, you know, strippers' boundaries. Um, you know, there's always an exception to the rule, but mostly, they, course, mostly they were, you know, on board with, with respect. Something, though, that I've heard from a lot of male strippers is that when they go and do these shows, women don't respect those rules. So the strippers will say, you know, please don't touch me or don't, you know, and the, the, the women get mm. quite drunk and quite grabby and, and actually yeah. really push those boundaries um, because they think it's harmless. You know, they think, oh, well, he likes it, which is really, really disappointing. Oh, that's so upsetting to hear. It is upsetting because yeah. I think we, we, you know, hope that women have that empathy for that sort of situation. But, and I'm, I'm not saying that everyone does. I'm sure there's a lot of respect for women, but generally they, they find that, you know, there's a lot of things that happen and boundary pushing that happens to male strippers, particularly when they go to do hens shows, hens nights and things like that um, which is really sad Mm, yeah interesting so there's somewhat potentially less stigma and discrimination that they face but potentially uh you know less actually respect of their bodily autonomy and absolutely that's really upsetting to hear and it actually reminds me totally going off topic uh, and I'm not a drag queen so I can't speak from experience but I know that in the drag scene um, there's a lot of negativity around uh, hen's nights and things like that that they'll go off to a drag show um, because it's not unusual for the women from hen's nights who are, as you say, you know, have had quite a lot to drink and they're all on a high yeah. to, um, to touch the drag queens, oh, no. to say really inappropriate things to be really sexual and that and, I mean it's just not okay of course that's not okay and it, it's really I mean far out this is definitely another episode topic but you know I don't understand why anyone struggles with the concept of consent but particularly a woman it, I yeah. mean that I don't hold them to a higher standard than men but I do expect that they would understand what it's like yeah to uh to have your boundaries breached so it really surprises me that they would be comfortable doing that but then I also under, I think that society has has raised a, a group of people who think that men always want sex and attention from women. Men have the right to say no as well. Absolutely. We do need to talk about that further for sure. Our misconception for this week is going to be a stripper misconception, a stripception, stripperception. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Jenna. Um. I, think, I feel like we're just repeating what we've just uh, discussed. But um, look, while I was dancing, uh, a colleague brought her partner in one night and it was lovely to meet him and we were all having a drink at the bar. And while we were all facing the other way, he reached across and he slapped me on the ass. And I stepped back and I said, what the fuck? <laughs> because you just do not touch a stripper. Obviously, there are some touching clubs. That's something else we didn't discuss. Some clubs you can touch strippers sure, above right. the waist during a lap dance with their consent, Right. But generally in a strip club, you don't. You just do not touch the dance. And given his partner works at that strip club, he would be aware that that was not a touching Very aware. Strip club. And the fact that yep. he was there with his partner, I thought was extremely disrespectful to then grab my ass, knowing mm. that they were in a strictly monogamous relationship. Anyway, uh, so I yeah, confronted him immediately and he denied it and she argued with me mm. and it became a bit of a thing. And then she said to me, well, if you don't want your ass grabbed, then don't be a stripper. And that to me was really wow. gross at the time and I didn't know how to argue with it, so I just left, um, left the situation. Um, so just, you know, reiterating basically that um, – 
Just because you're a stripper doesn't mean that you consent to being touched. Just because you're showing any amount of skin is not consent. Um, just because you do any sort of job is not consent. The only consent that is consent is consent. If my husband slapped the ass of one of my full service sex worker friends, I would be fucking mortified. Mm. And he never would. He would never, ever, ever do that. That is disgusting. Yeah. Oh, I I can't understand I can't. why she wasn't ashamed. I would be embarrassed myself just because yeah. of the disrespect. Just like that's my friend. Like, but like, yeah. what are you doing? She didn't anyway. And you know, my husband and I, we have an open relationship, and I love him having sex with other people and all of that. But if we were out and he did that in front of me, yeah, like that's not cool. It's not. Cool. What are you doing? Hello, this is Jenna from the future. I just wanted to let you know that there is a bit of discussion of suicide in this next segment. So if you'd like to skip that, just head to 4515 for our question of the week. So for shit people say this week, we thought we would return to the uh, the good old BuzzFeed videos that generated so much beautiful conversation on Facebook that we referenced in our first episode, um, because there is just so much on there. And so just before recording this, we were supposed to record at 1.30, um, and then at 1.45, I realized I had spent 15 minutes getting angry and responding to more comments on this because it is just endless. But anyway, there there's literally so much gold in this that we could bring out for you, but I just wanted to pull out two in particular that really struck me uh, today. Somebody has responded to somebody else. They've said, you say that it's just sex, but it's a sweaty, heaving stranger ejaculating inside you. First of all, who says they're sweating? <laughs> Who says they're heaving? And who the fuck says they're ejaculating inside me? But that's a whole other conversation. That poor girl had her bowels ripped. Actually, what she wrote was that poor girl had her bowls ripped, but I'm assuming she meant bowels because I don't know. I don't think I have bowls. And like, for reference, in the video, I spoke about a fisting incident that I had where I got a tear in my vagina because something went a little bit wrong with the fisting. It really wasn't that big a deal. It was unfortunate timing. Obviously, I had to cancel some bookings because I had an open wound in my vagina. But like, vaginal tears are very, very common. Like, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, I've got them from just normal sex. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I responded to her and I was like, bowels ripped, settle down, like set, like settle down. Wow. Like the people on this thread are just so fucking dramatic. They are so intense. I'm like, I, I said I had a tear in my vagina and her brain heard that my bowels were ripped. Like what the fuck? Settle down. That's just a little one. But the other, that was just, I thought bizarre. But the other one that I was like, this is incre- like this is awful, is uh, Cheryl, who said, I wonder where they are now. I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of them didn't kill themselves by now. And like, Jesus fucking Christ, Cheryl, what is actually wrong with you that you think that that is an appropriate thing to post? That is, that is so disgusting. I just... I can't imagine ever saying something like that on a to about anyone. That's awful. I literally I don't have anything to say because it makes me speechless. Like I feel I, you can never stop me talking about anything. I just chat. I can chat for hours, but <laughs> that is just so disgusting. I feel like a lot of us can have emotions about things and we can react to things, but like to say that like you. Wouldn't be surprised if someone had killed themselves is just revolting. Like, how do you live with that sort of statement? Particularly after watching a video of three women talking about how much they love their lives. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, that's kind of just weird to start with. Yeah, they seem really well adjusted and really happy. And, you know, I just think, wow. Um, so I hope Cheryl's okay because it's projecting i think but um yeah that's that's really well, that's a really sad thing to, to feel that's a fair to, point yeah yeah to, to comment on someone's yeah really upsetting and i think it just comes back to i mean you know i think you and i've talked about before that there is the internet is one of the problems with it of course is that we're all talking to strangers we don't you know they're not human beings in our minds and i think that like what's what i found about those comments is 99 percent of them 
had no concept that the people that they were speaking about and speaking about incredibly graphically and cruelly would ever see their comments, which is ridiculous because I don't know why they would think that we wouldn't see the comments. But there's this real sense of it just doesn't – I don't think it seems real to them. They watch this video and they don't think it's real. They don't think about the fact that there are human beings in the video. And and so if you add that concept of – it just that massive distance you add on top of that, that people don't realize that sex workers exist and that we are real people and we're not just things in the movies. They just, they just don't see us as real. They just don't. The amount of times, I think you pointed this out that, you know, they would say something really cruel and I would comment and be like, wow, that's, that's quite cruel. And they would be like, oh, oh, sorry. I, I mean, I respect you, but mm. blah, blah, blah. And it's like as soon as you and, – and, I mean, that's the whole reason why we're here, isn't it? That's why the podcast exists yeah. because we want to tell people that we exist. Yeah, we're humans. That we're human yeah. beings. Multifaceted. That's literally it. We're not trying to say that our work is empowering. We're not <laughs> trying to say it's inspiring. We're not trying to suggest that your daughter should grow up and do this. We're literally just simply saying we exist, we're human beings. Yeah, we're people. Yeah. And don't talk about us dying. Fuck. Yeah. The question of the week this week is, what's the most partners you have had in a gangbang? Well, I tried to have 30 for my 30th um, birthday. I was like, well, I'm only going to turn 30 once, so I need to have a 30 people gangbang for my 30th because, like, well, obviously that's what I need to do. Like, I'm not going to wait till I'm 40, so I have to do that now. But then even though we had, like, over 30 people booked in to attend, which you have to do with gangbangs because people always bail – only 25 men showed up, but I had four other sex workers who were acting kind of as fluffers and stuff. Um, so it was still a 30 yes. person gangbang, but it was 25 dudes, 25 penises. That's so cool. Um, I remember seeing you advertising for that and I was like, wow, that's iconic. That's so cool. Um <laughs> I have not had many gangbangs, uh, but generally it's the most people I've sort of been, you know, in that situation with is uh, two other workers and myself and a client. So four people in total. So not many for me. I'm a little bit innocent on the gangbang side of things, but always looking for more experiences. Have you done any uh, things with multiple men and yourself? Never. I have never been with more than one man at a time. (gasps) Never. I know. I'm a, an a MMF virgin. I know. I really need wow. two guys to spit roast me, you know. <laughs> yeah, you do, babe. You do. It's so good. <laughs> One day. Maybe for your 40th we'll have a 40-person gangbang. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe for my 40th you can do a 40-person gangbang and you'll watch. I'll watch. Okay. I'm down. <laughs> wow. Okay. There, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> In, uh, what is it, eight years' time, Holly Hart will be doing a 40-person gangbang. We'd like to thank our patrons this week. Our new generous somebodies are our secret admirer, Gricey and Stu. Our very generous somebodies are Lachlan, Timmy, Steve, our footstool, Spaceman Dan, Pete, Adele, Alice Gray, Big M, Scott C, Sammy Jane, Bart, Barleyman, Randy Wagner, Robbie Hart and Andrew. And our extremely generous somebodies are Aaron, Samuel and Andrew. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this extremely Holly-centric episode this week. Hope you've enjoyed it, learned something, and had a bit of a laugh, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Please look out for us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon. Our name everywhere is Somebody You Pod, as in podcast. Our Patreon starts at just $3 a month, and you can get all of our episodes ad-free and a day early, plus bonus episodes, behind-the-scenes action, bloopers, and more. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the voices of sex workers. And remember, somebody you love might just be a sex worker.